how does it work. So I'm going to kind of get a little more into the calculations a little bit. Okay, so one of, the, one of the first things we need to figure out is the test statistic. We're using a t-test statistic. Obviously, this is called a t-test because we're using the t-distribution. Uh, in general, um, a one-population uh, t-test, think of it as the sample minus the population divided by the standard error. So we're basically using the same formula for standard error that we used for confidence intervals. But now what we're seeing is how many standard errors is my sample mean, this x bar right here, 11.898, how far is that from the population mean in the null hypothesis? So really it's a comparison of 11.898 and 11. How far apart are those? I know I get, always get stat students that think they can look at it and say, I know, I know those are close. Uh, you don't really know. You don't want to really go with your gut on that. I don't know how close these are. That's why I need to calculate the test statistic. I know how far apart they are in terms of dollars, but I don't know is how many standard errors apart or if they're significantly different. Okay? So, again, that's where we want to make this calculation. So the formula for it I have on the board over here is, is the sample mean x bar minus mu, that's the population mean, and then we divide by the standard error. The standard error is S, standard deviation, divided by the square root of N. And this, remember, was a standard error estimation formula. So it's the trying to estimate what we think the standard deviation of the sampling distribution would look like. And again, that is actually the same formula we were using for one population mean confidence intervals in um, our last unit. All right, so we're just plugging in numbers now. So I'm going to do 11.898 minus 11, and then I'm going to divide by the standard deviation, 6.043, divided by the square root of 324. And if you do that little calculation, you get 2.675 approximately. So I rounded it, but around 2.675. Okay? It is positive. Now remember, the, the t-test statistic in some ways works a lot like the z-test statistic that we looked at for proportions. It's counting how many standard errors is the sample from the population parameter. So in our case here, um, if you look at it, the number of standard errors that the sample mean is above or below the population mean. Again, if the t-score is positive, the t-test statistic is positive, the sample mean was above the population mean, and if the t-test statistic was negative, the sample mean was below the population mean. I mean. We can see right here, visually, this sample mean is above 11, right? So we should get a positive t-test statistic. If this was lower than 11, then we would have gotten a negative t-test statistic. So if I, again, one of the key things is whenever you calculate something, you want to really be in the habit of being able to explain it to people, right? So what is this t-test statistic telling me? The sample mean, $11.898, is 2.675, not dollars, 2.675 standard errors higher than the population mean, $11. Okay, so remember that the Z and T test statistics measure the number of standard errors. They don't measure percentages, they don't measure dollars, they don't measure kilograms, they always measure number of standard errors. And that's what makes them a standardizing uh, measure of significance. Okay? Now I went ahead and go ahead and went with a 5% significance level. If you guys remember, that's the, the significance level we use most of the time. Now remember, this was a two-tailed test, okay? So with a 5% significance level. So that's going to come into play when we try to figure out what the critical values are. Now, like I say, a lot of computer programs, these numbers would just be given to you in like a chart. A lot of times in Statcato or other programs like Statcato, you'd get, you'd get all these numbers in a chart. But I, I, liked, I, I really like StatKey's theoretical distribution calculator because it shows me visually what the, where these numbers are coming from. Okay? And I, I went ahead and put these numbers into StatKey in the theoretical distribution calculator T. Remember, stat key is found on lock5stat.com. 
It's a really great program for sort of introducing some of these ideas and statistics. All right, so again, we had a 5% significance level, but it's broken up into two tails. Two tails. So um, I'm going to need to uh, break up the 5% into two tails. Well, that would mean I'd need 2.5% in each tail. So the percentage in the tail, this would be a, a T curve with a degrees of freedom of 323. So this again is a T curve. This is a T curve, T distribution with a degrees of freedom 323. Now when I put those numbers in, um, again, uh, I put in 0 0.025 in the tails. I think that was the default when I first pulled open the, the T distribution with this degrees of freedom. And it gave me the two critical values. Now if you have a right tail test, you'll have one critical value on the right. And if you have a left tail test, you'll have one critical value on the left. This one has two critical values because there's two tails. A lot of times when you get a program and they give you critical values, if you see those two different critical values, that usually goes with you're dealing with a two tail test. All right, so basically the right tail starts at positive 1.967. So any test statistic that's above 1.967 is going to be considered significant. Also, the left test uh, critical value was negative 1.967. So any test statistic below negative 1.967 would be considered significant as well. Now, I always like to kind of think about the numbers, right? Here's 0 in the middle, right? Here's 1 and negative 1. Here's 2 and negative 2. Here's like negative 4s out here. And, Maybe positive 4 is out here somewhere. So where is our test statistic? Our test statistic was 2.675 positive. You don't have to do this, but I'm always a big, whenever I'm dealing with things that could be negative or positive, and that's really important, I usually make a little positive sign next to the number just to remind myself that this was a positive test statistic. So where's positive 2.675? Uh, 2.675 is in the right tail. Remember, in a two-tailed test, your test statistic is not going to fall in both tails. But if it falls in either of the two tails, it's significant. If it falls in the middle, then it's not significant. Okay? So this T test statistic is falling in the tail uh, determined by one of the critical values. And we learned that that means that the sample data significantly disagrees with the null hypothesis. But it also tells me that the sample mean, right, because that was the representative statistic of the sample data, significantly disagrees with the population mean 11. Remember how some of you were thinking these two look close? They're not close. They're actually significantly different. This sample mean 11.898 is significantly bigger than 11, especially for this sample size. Okay? Now, so we got that. We know it's a significant disagreement with the null hypothesis. Now what about the p-value? Traditionally, a p-value would be calculated based on the test statistic. So the probability in the tail of the t-curve um, corresponding to the test statistic itself. Um, so if we were doing a, you know, a traditional t-test, um, our test statistic was 2.675, so if I put that number in this bottom, again, I went to the theoretical distributions calculator, the same T calculator in stat key, and I put in degrees of freedom 323, so it's the same curve, and I just, instead of having these critical value numbers, I just put in the test statistic. Now, I just put it in the, the right tail because uh, it is a positive T test statistic. The left tail automatically adjusted. So when I did that, when I put the test statistic in the bottom box of uh, stat key, um, I, it, the computer gave me this number, 0 .0039. That's the percentage in the tail. It also, because I'm dealing with a two-tailed test, it also calculated the same 0 .0039 on the left tail. Now, if you're dealing with a right tail test, the p-value would just be the right tail, 0 .0039. But because this is a two-tailed test, I have to incorporate both of them. So the total p-value would be 0 .0039 plus 0 
or 0 0.0078. That's my p-value. 0 0.0078. Remember, that's a percentage that we want to compare to the 5%. So I like to turn it back into a percentage. You multiply that 0 0.0078 by 100, we get 0.78%. So the question is, is that lower or higher than 5%? Well, it's not even 1%, right? We're at 0.78%, so we're lower than 1%. Also, 0 0.0078 is definitely lower than 0 0.05, right? If I wrote the 5% significance level, a lot of times you'd see it as alpha equals 0 0.05, right? That's kind of how you'd see it in scientific articles and things. And 0 0.0078 is definitely lower than 0 0.05. So we have a low p-value. We have a low p-value, right? It's lower than the significance level. So since it's lower than the significance level, that means that if the null was true, this sample data is unlikely to just be the result of sampling variability or random chance. So it's not, this, this sample data isn't disagreeing or is a very unlikely to be disagreeing with the null hypothesis just because all random samples disagree a little bit. This is disagreeing because this null hypothesis is probably wrong. That's kind of how you want to think about it. If a low p-value means it's unlikely to be sampling variability and that allows us to think, oh, okay, well then this null hypothesis is probably wrong. So that's why we say, when the p-value is less than the significance level, we say reject the null hypothesis. All right? That was our rule that we learned uh, in previous videos. Okay, So we got a low p-value and we're rejecting the null hypothesis. So what would be the final conclusion? Well, in conclusions, we have to deal with evidence and claim. Okay, A low p-value from sample data that meets the requirements of assumptions would be considered some evidence. So if I am assuming that this met all the assumptions, I am going to have a, some kind of evidence. Also, the claim was actually the null hypothesis. That's kind of rare. Actually, it's usually, usually the claim is the alternative. But um, in this problem, the claim was the null. So when I rejected the null, haven't I?